Hi guys, Thane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of Losing My Virginity by Richard Branson, the number one international bestseller. So uh, I've had this book lying around for a while now, it's non-fiction, Richard Branson's autobiography, and um, I actually read the prologue to it and enjoyed it, and then just put it back down for whatever reason, and then I picked it up recently because I was travelling to visit um, my mum, we were actually going to a family funeral, and... Um, one of my um, traditions, I suppose, is that I um, I always take the longest unread book that I own with me when I go travelling. And uh, so this happened to be this one just purely due to size. Actually, when you look at it, the print's quite large. Um, it's also got some images inside, some photos, although a page of the photos fell out for me. Um, and it only comes to 520 pages long. So I would normally read you the blurb, but apparently we don't have one. Yeah, we don't have one. So uh, we start off with, uh, I'm just going to go through and look at my tabs. We start off with a chapter on his, uh, uh, sort of one of his adventures, but then we go all the way back to the start. So it says, when he left school in 1967, aged almost 17, my headmaster's parting words to me were, congratulations, Branson. I predict that you will either go to prison or become a millionaire. I thought this is quite clever. And this is a good example of like the hustle that he displayed, I suppose, to, to get his companies off the ground. Uh, so this is, this is the time when he was working on his magazine and he says, the wars in Vietnam and Biafra were the two leading issues of the late 1960s. If student was to be a credible publication, we had to have our own reporters in both countries. We had no money to send any reporters out there, let alone pay for them to stay in hotels and tell ex-back articles, so we had to think laterally. We finally came up with the idea that if we chose very young reporters, then they might be a story in themselves. So I called up the Daily Mirror and asked whether they would be interested in running an exclusive story about a 17-year-old reporter going to Vietnam. They bought the story and paid for Julian Mannion, who was working with us as a student, to go to Vietnam. Julian went there, filed some great articles about the Vietnam War, and subsequently went on to become a famous ITN reporter. We managed to make the same arrangement with sending a 16-year-old reporter to Biafra. These two ventures were my first experience of leveraging the student name. We put in the name and the people, and the other side put up the money to fund it. I thought this is a great quote as well. Um, he says, while I oppose Vietnam, I didn't feel as passionately left-wing on other issues as most of my fellow demonstrators. I suppose I am left-wing, I told a reporter from The Guardian. Well, only to the extent that I think left-wing views are sane and rational. Uh, this is a little bit of a crazy story here from 1971. Kristen and I set off early the next morning and walked from Alberta along the Grand Union Canal to South Wharf Road. I wondered when the raid would be. We crossed over the footbridge beside St Mary's Hospital and walked along the path. As we walked by the hospital, there was a scream above us. A body fell out of the sky and hit the railings beside us. I caught a glimpse of an old man's grey, unshaven face as he hit the railings. It was horrific. His body seemed to explode and a huge amount of entrails fell onto the ground or hung dripping in red and white shiny rings from the railing. He was naked apart from his white dressing gown, which quickly began to soak up the blood. Kristen and I were too shocked to do anything other than stop and stare. He was clearly dead on impact. His neck hung off from his body and his back seemed to be broken in half. As we stared at the corpse, a hospital nurse came running over from the side door. There was nothing she could do. Someone else came rushing out with a white sheet and covered the body and the bits in the street. Kristen and I stood there, enveloped by silence, until we became aware of the noises of everyday life. Traffic, horns blowing and birdsong. Yeah, so Tony Mellor, who was working on the mail order list at Virgin, um, he said there was one golden unbreakable rule. Virgin doesn't ever, ever stock Andy Williams. Although I, I don't mind a bit of Andy Williams here and there. We get this quite bizarre paragraph here as well, but you know, it's interesting. Like he does write with a lot of honesty. He says, uh, Kirsten and I also had a bizarre sexual allergy to each other. Whenever we made love, a painful rash spread across me, which would take about three weeks to heal. We went to a number of doctors, but we never resolved the problem. I even had a circumcision to try to stop the reaction. Being, circumci bleh, being circumcised age 24 is not a good idea. Particularly if the night after your operation you find yourself watching J Jane Fonda's erotic film Barbarella. Before I could stop myself, I had burst my stitches. Hearing my screaming, Kirsten came running to see what the matter was. When she found out what had happened, she was in stitches. I no longer was. And he's talking about some of the acts he signed. So they signed 10CC, uh, the reggae band. And I didn't realise, uh, he says here, 10CC is named after the average amount of sperm in the human ejaculation. They almost had to... Um, because of the Sex Pistols album, never mind the bollocks. They basically had to linguistically define bollocks. Um, so we get this. So one of your staff has been arrested for displaying the word bollocks, said Professor Kingsley. What a load of bollocks. Actually, the word bollocks is an 18th century nickname for priests. And then, because priests generally seem to speak such a lot of nonsense in their sermons, bollocks gradually came to mean rubbish. 
So bollocks actually means either priest or rubbish, I checked, making sure I hadn't missed anything. And it does. Uh, we get this bit here. Uh, there was no way out. Over the next few weeks, my visits to Joan amassed me an impressive collection of old hand-painted tin signs which advertised anything from Hovis bread to woodbine cigarettes. One tin sign read, Dive in here for tea. I also bought a large pig which played the symbols and had once stood in a butcher's shop. One of my favourite signs was an old picture advertising Danish bacon and eggs which showed a pig leaning casually against a wall listening to a chicken singing. The chicken was celebrating her freshly laid egg and the caption to the scene was, Now that's what I call music. I gave this to Simon Draper, since he was always terribly grumpy in the mornings until he had eaten a decent breakfast. He hung it over his desk, where it later inspired the title for our annual Greatest Hits compilations, now that's what I call music, which have reached number one every year since. Didn't realise that Virgin were responsible to those things. I think they're still going as well. And here we get the, um, this is the origin of Virgin Airways. It's, this story's been told quite a lot, actually. Um, Joan and I stayed on Beef Island for the rest of that holiday, and it was there that I sat up and it was there that I set up Virgin Airways. We were trying to catch a flight to Puerto Rico, but the local Puerto Rican scheduled flight was cancelled. The airport terminal was full of stranded passengers. I made a few calls to charter companies and agreed to charter a plane for $2,000 to Puerto Rico. I divided the price by the number of seats, borrowed a blackboard and wrote Virgin Airways, $39 single flight to Puerto Rico. I walked around the airport terminal and soon filled every seat on the charter plane. As we landed at Puerto Rico, a passenger turned to me and said, Virgin Airways isn't too bad. Smarten up the service a little and you could be in business. I might just do that, I laughed. And then I don't really have any notes here for a further 170 odd pages. There's just a lot of legal battles with British Airways, basically, which weren't particularly interesting. It says here, uh, Virgin marketed Sega as the cool game to play. And initially we sold it on the basis that while your younger brother may be happy with Nintendo games such as Super Mario and Game Boy, the smarter games for smarter kids were ones such as Sega Sonic the Hedgehog. Then, as the market developed rapidly, we found that younger and younger boys were buying Sonic. They all wanted to be like their older brothers. And th this is, I think, from my perception of it when I was a kid, Sega was definitely perceived as the, game, the console that was for younger kids. And then Nintendo was like the hardcore gamers console. And then something called the PlayStation came out, but I didn't have one until like five years after it was first released because we never had any money. So, as I say, there's a lot of this stuff about the sketchy stuff going on between BA and uh, Virgin. And uh, I'm just going to read this one here, because I think this is very typical. Then, on 16th of July, Lord King stood up at the British Airways annual general meeting and announced that British Airways would stop making its annual donations to the Conservative Party. Lord King had failed to spot that this gave away the fact that they thought that donating money to the Conservatives in the past had helped them secure various privileges. Some critics pointed out that these same donations, which totaled £180,000 since BA had been privatised in 1987, had helped secure a sympathetic hearing whenever British Airways needed to speak to the Department of Transport. If an airline in Nigeria gave money and free air tickets to the ruling party in return for being granted a monopoly, it would be scorned in the West as being blatantly corrupt. It's impossible to do business in Africa, people would retort. Look at the Nigerians, they're so damn corrupt. The round of applause that British Airways won for this announcement at its annual general meeting on the 16th of July struck me as amusing. I thought this was kind of funny as well, bearing in mind later events. Um, they were talking about tape recorders and Chris says, uh, believe it or not, the news of the world are the only paper to have got that all sorted. There'll be, there'll be nobody there now and tomorrow's going to be too late. I can believe that the news of the world would be the only newspaper to have all of hidden cameras and microphones sorted, considering that they later got done for wiretapping people's phones. And uh, people started receiving phone calls from BA asking why they booked Virgin Atlantic rather than BA and like offering them free flights if they switched to BA and stuff. It was very dirty tactics that they used. So here we have, uh, this is what BA was getting up to. So on the 6th of February, Yvonne Parsons was at home when someone purporting to be from Virgin's reservations department called her to say that her flight was overbooked. Since she hadn't been issued with a ticket, would she mind changing to a British Airways flight? This was the last straw. Yvonne Parsons had flown to and from the States four times in the last eight months, and each time there had been an alleged booking error with Virgin. The previous October, Parsons had been called in her New York office by a Virgin representative, who gave her name as Mary Ann, and told her that her Virgin flight was overbooked, and, to compensate for the inconvenience, she could fly, at no extra cost, the following day on Concord. Parsons refused. She flew to and from New York and London regularly, and she preferred Virgin. Once she got onto the plane, she was a valuable customer and she was rather surprised that Virgin was being so casual about her. She asked to be waitlisted for her flight and asked Marianne to call her the next day to let her know whether she was on or not. And uh, needless to say, she didn't get one. 
As with Bonnie from Virgin in August, who had told her that the flight was delayed, and Larry from Virgin in September, who said that all non-smoking seats were full, Mary Ann failed to call Yvonne Parsons back. So Parsons called up Virgin Reservations and asked to speak to Mary Ann. There's no Mary Ann here, she was told. Then who called me yesterday and said that I was bounced off the 16th of October flight, Parsons asked. The 16th of October? No, you're confirmed on that flight, non-smoking. And yeah, it's like this discreet, this uh, deception operation BA was running. It's kind of messed up. So all in all, I mean, I did think this, the war with BA probably took up too much of this book. And it kind of felt as though Branson was, had got this vendetta that, you know, it was an unfinished vendetta against them, you know. Yeah, overall, I thought it was pretty good. I think the stuff with BA was probably, um, it went on a little bit too long, really. And um, this probably could have been 100 pages shorter and it would have still been pretty good. But um, yeah, there's lots of stuff here. I would say it's probably best to read if you're interested in business, you consider yourself an entrepreneur or something like that and you want some ideas to become a better business person. Or if you're, for whatever reason, really interested in Richard Branson, then I'm sure you would like it as well. So um, I gave it a uh, four out of five, yeah. So there we have it. That's what I thought of Losing My Virginity by Richard Branson. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.